Well, amen. Welcome to chapel. Do you love the Lord today? Amen. Now, we, we did that countdown video to, as an exercise of worship. Everybody raise your hands like this. Amen. So bro, <laughs> Brother Matthew said that uh, he better see some hands raised here this morning. So uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to be able to laugh and smile and just to rejoice, as Paul would say, uh, to the Philippians in the Lord. I'm going to have uh, this morning one of our students come and introduce our speaker uh, because our speaker today is his pastor, so give him that privilege to do that. And After uh, Justin introduces our speaker, then Christine will come and pray for us, Miss Christine Potter, and then we will uh, get into our worship and be led by our team today. So, Brother Justin, you can come. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a great day to be out in the house of the Lord. Uh, we are blessed today to have my pastor, Brother Tony Hall, of uh, First Baptist Church of Bronston in Bronston, Kentucky. He has been my pastor for about a year now, and uh, previously before that, he's pastor at Barnesburg, uh, Baptist Church in Barnesburg, Kentucky. Um, if you think he looks funny now, you should have just been there at Laurel Lake Baptist Camp with uh, all of us last this past summer, dressing up as Mephibosheth uh, in front of everybody, limping around, and... Um, not only that, but I hate to break it to you, Brother Tony, but the Packers aren't going to make the playoffs. I'm sorry. Sorry to crush your dreams there. So we are very blessed and glad to have him this morning. Uh, Sister Christine, uh, come and pray for us, please. Hi, everybody, and welcome to chapel. There were no requests in the box, um, so let's pray. Dear God, thank you for today, and thank you that we could co just come here today and worship you and serve you more, learn more about you, and thank you for the privilege to know you personally as our Savior, and help us to all just follow you more each and every day, and bless the speaker and the music as we prepare to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, everybody, every once in a while, I want to throw a new song at you, and this one is one that I consider to be a toe tapper. So I hope you guys will worship along with us. I know it'll be new, so uh, just follow along with us. But over time, I pray um, it is important for Christians to be joyful in the house of the Lord. Amen? So we're going to make a joyful noise and talk about how we are all bound for glory. So stand with me this morning and sing Bound for Glory. It's a wonderful truth. And all my pain, hurt and shame, gone when Jesus calls my name. Endless joy, endless praise, all oh, when Jesus calls my name. And all my pain, hurt and shame, gone when Jesus calls my name. Endless joy, endless praise. Oh, when Jesus calls my name, I am free because I'm bound. I am bound for heaven's gate. 
where my feet will stand on holy ground. I am bound for glory. I am free because I'm bound. I am bound for heaven's gate. Where my feet will stand on holy ground. I am bound for glory. Where my feet will stand on holy ground. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Ten 
thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, now as we enter into this time of prayer, God, that during this time we will remember all the reasons, Lord, thousands of them, God, even more than 10,000 reasons, Lord, for us to worship you in spirit and truth. And God, this morning as we declare that we are bound for glory, that no matter what we are going through, if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, this is not the end. I know after a long week of testing and midterms last week and looking ahead to the second half of the semester, God, we can all get discouraged and think, oh my goodness, will this ever end? But God, your word tells us, Lord, that we are bound for a place with streets of gold and gates of pearl. And so, God, I pray this morning that we will focus on that truth, knowing that there are joyous days ahead no matter what we may be facing now. And for those of us that are on the mountaintop right now, God, that everything, Lord, is just sunshine and roses. Lord, we ask for you to help us remember to glorify you now so that we're in that valley, God, that we will still worship you the same as on the mountaintop. So, Lord, this morning I invite us all, either sitting or standing or coming forward at this time, Lord, to pray and to ask you, Lord, for strength for the rest of today. Join us now as we pray. Nice. 
didn't deserve anything but damnation and hell, God. You saw fit to send your one and only son to save us. Such amazing grace, Lord. Help us never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross, Lord. Let us see it like the first time, standing as a sinner lost, undone by mercy, and left speechless, watching wide-eyed at that cost. May we never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's kind of, uh, I'll just tell you, it, it, it scares me anytime I stand before a group of uh, pastors, preachers, and professors. I asked the church last night to uh, be praying for us, not only as we traveled here today, but also that nobody looked at me and said, why did we pass that guy? I, I, I always uh, think about those kinds of things. I remember sitting back and uh, being there, I want to encourage you, if you've been on this educational journey for a while or a short time, uh, that if you just trust in the Lord, He'll endure you through it all. Uh, I am partially an example of that as I started taking classes at Clear Creek in 2006, and I graduated in spring of 2017. Uh, and I keep telling people, I said, there's only special people can take a four years and make it 11. I wanted to extend it out as long as I could. Uh, but uh, no, I, I did uh, enjoy every moment. Uh, and Justin, if they keep playing the way that they are, they won't make the playoffs. I'm honest about things. But I, I do have UK on my watch, so we're playing okay right now. Uh, so uh, I want to invite you to take your copy of God's Word this morning and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to begin reading in verse 15. Ephesians 5. And we're going to just read two verses this morning. This was laid on me uh, almost the very moment that Charlie had asked me to come uh, nearly six to seven months ago. Ephesians 5, verse 15. And I would like to ask you, those that can and will, to please stand with me as we read God's Word. Ephesians 5, chapter 5, verse 15 says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Heavenly Fathers, we look to your word. Let it speak above any other voice that comes from me. Let your truth reign. Let your spirit move and let you speak to each of us through your word, through this epistle that you charged Paul to write so many years ago. But Father, it holds truth for us today. Let us be a people that take in your truth and apply it to our own lives, and it is in Christ's name that we do pray, amen. You know, when I, I thought about this, one thing that God really did lay on me, though, that I wanted to encourage you in, one of the things that I've seen in ministry over the last, uh, like I said, I went to school for nearly 11 years, there were gaps in the middle, encouragement from Dr. Fox and uh, Brother Shannon Benefield to, uh, to finish, to, to step in and get it done, and that encouragement pushed me on, and, and it helped me get to the point of being there. But I've pastored for almost 10 years, and one of the things that I've seen is detrimental to all of us is when we spend time trying to be someone we're not behind the pulpit. I am not Charles Spurgeon. I am not anybody else. I am 
Berwin, Anthony, Pugs, Berwin, Tony, whatever you want to call me, Hall. That's it. I, I, I'm, I'm a short guy. I'm glad that the pulpit here is short uh, so I can see it. Still, the mic feels like it would hit me in the forehead if I moved it forward a little bit. But I am who I am. And God called you as who you were. And we've seen that song lots of times in our churches, Just As I Am. And, and sometimes we get so caught up in it and we think about it. Ah, I know the words. I don't even have to look at it. I, we just lean back and sing it until it's done. I always think it's funny. The minute you turn to look at the song leader or to look at the piano or organist, they will look out into to the congregation. And before you even get done doing this and you turn around, if you're in church with the books, they close the books, they put them in there, and they're like, all right, hope nobody's got anything to say because I'm hungry. Now, we try to be somebody we're not. We try to be more than what we are. We get worried about all of these different things going on. Then we're not just as we are anymore, but we're trying to be somebody else. God's already called those pastors that have gone before us and that still lead in our different congregations or different uh, associations, but He called you to be you. Touched by Him, changed by Him, moved by Him, but He called you to be you. So don't try to be somebody else. By all means, be who you are. And that God laid on me, and then He, he really got a hold of me as I was reading this, and Paul's challenging to the Ephesians here that he's challenging them to walk in a way that would honor Christ. And when we're being who God calls us to be, we're going to honor Christ because he's the one that is guiding our lives. He's the one that is holding our lives. And when it gets to this point of the scripture we looked at today, he says, See ye then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So as you're being who you are and as God calls you to be, you have to be careful as a leader to pay attention to your own walk first. You see, it's easy as a pastor or a leader in a church or even in a college or in an association to fall into that trap of worrying about everybody else's trouble walking the way God wants them to walk. If I asked you today to make a list of people in the churches you are called to serve that are not walking as God wanted them to walk and wants a Christian to walk, every one of us would just about be able to fill up half of a notebook sheet, wouldn't we? Because we see people that are doing that all the time, and we concern ourselves with it. But Paul says you need to worry about your own walk first. Jesus taught us a parable. He says, how can I teach somebody else if i got this big pole sticking out of my own eye? Yes, I know, that's not the way Jesus said it, but we're in Kentucky. Well, I figured you'd understand that better. As leaders, we must pay attention to our own walk. He starts this off, he says, See then, we must be fully aware of our steps. I know where the steps end on this. I know where the steps end on the the, the platform where I, I preach at home and, and most of the places I'm at, but I won't lie to you. There's times I've been, anybody else ever done that? I, I've seen a couple of hands up. Some of you just don't want to admit it. It's okay. Where, where you're over it, and sometimes you get to the edge, and what I've noticed is those folks out there that know where the edge is, they start biting on their nails, waiting. Is he going to fall? Is he going to hold on? Is he still going to be up there? You know, when we think about these different things, so what does that have to do with anything? You know, we're so focused about everything else, sometimes we don't know where we're stepping ourselves. And we can get ourselves into trouble. Paul says in Ephesians 5.15, See then, talking directly to them, we must make ourselves fully aware of our steps. Or it is translated in other versions, be careful. I don't know what version you're carrying with you whenever uh, we, we use the King James at church, but I study from about five different Bibles when I'm sitting down and studying. I'm looking up the, uh, the root words of the Greek or Hebrew, depending on which scripture I'm in, and I try to study as much as I personally can. But we look at this. He says, be careful. Are we being careful where we walk? Are we being careful how we walk? Are we being careful uh, as people follow us where we're walking? Folks, we have got to be careful as we walk. And he goes on further. He says, you walk circumspectly. Be careful. Don't walk like a fool. 
Don't look, go out acting like, like somebody that doesn't know what he's doing or she's doing. Now, there are men and women leaders in every single church that you have. Uh, and I, I consider myself to be blessed to be at Bronston where there's a, a good group of women leaders that lead the younger women. And there's a gru good group of, of men leaders that try to lead uh, the men and try to lead them in the right direction. But at the same time, there's times we look and say, man, alive, I hope nobody was following me when I did that. You ever done that? You walked, you went somewhere, you done something, and you would say that God would consider us acting as a fool Say, I hope nobody was watching that. It's kind of like that time when you're having that, that sleep and you're, you're dreaming <laughs> and, and you're good in the sleep and all of a sudden you do something silly like jump in your bed. You know, you're, you're half in and out. And the first thing you do is what? You open your eyes to look and see if anybody's seen you, right? It, did, did somebody see me do that? Now, if you're a single student and you're sharing a room with somebody over there at, at uh, wherever you may be, you probably want, and I hope that they didn't see me do that. I hope nobody seen me do that ignorant thing that I just done. But everybody does it. Everybody falls into the, these bad times. Everybody falls in and does something that is not intelligent, that, that's not something we know we ought to do. But as Christians, we are called to be careful where we step. So when Paul says, see then, he's saying, be careful. And he says, don't walk don't don't act like a fool in the way that you go every step we take should be covered by the guidance of Christ every single step we take even those we think that we know we ought to be taken we better still have it bathed in prayer to where we know where and what and how we need to respond to each thing there have been things in my life I just want to take you, take you through a little bit of, of how my wife and I and my children, how we ended up at Bronston. There was different opportunities and different things that I, that I could have done. And each time, and some of them were things I really, 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 really wanted to do. Those are the things that hurt to say no to, right? Because you see it yourself, you're like, man, I would love to be doing that. But that's not what God wants. And you may even get a little aggravated with God because he won't let you do what you want to do. But we continued praying. And I graduated in spring of 2017. In the fall of 2017, God moved us to Bronston in September. Before we got to that process, I'd been contacted, so I began to pray about, the, about, about sending a resume there. Because I didn't want to send it where God didn't want me to be. And then... I thought to myself, is this just me desiring a move or is this God moving me? Is this God preparing us? And after I talked to my wife about it, because gentlemen, I'm just going to tell you this. Married or not, here's a free tidbit for you. Everything when you're married, you and your spouse should talk about together. There should never be anything hidden between your wife and yourself. You ought to be able to, to discuss any kind of spiritual move, things like that now. There are things that you may discuss better with a, be with, with a best friend that's of your same gender, but as spouses together should discuss any move that's going to involve the family should be bathed in prayer. So my wife and I began to pray about it. I asked her, I said, are you feeling the same thing that I am, that it's okay for me to go ahead and send this resume? And she said, yeah, go ahead. And then we sent it, and I had conversations, sat through the pulpit committee meetings, and the second meeting, my wife went with me, and we said, before the pulpit committee meeting. Still not, hadn't discussed a whole lot with our children yet because everything we did was going to affect our children. But when we knew how serious it was and we felt God moving us, it was not just my wife and I that sat down, but we sat down with all three of our children. Now, my son's not with us today. Todd's 18. He graduated last year. He and Justin and about... Well, five others, we had about seven graduating last year's uh, graduating class between our high schools there in Pulaski County. My daughters are with me. One's a sophomore, one's a seventh grader. We said, we want you all to pray about it too. Every single thing you say. But what does that have to do with anything you're going? Because I want my children to see that my steps, the steps I'm taking are covered by prayer, that they're bathed in prayer, and that the things that we do, we run by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. 
because I don't want my children growing up not knowing that their mommy and their daddy prayed about things before they did it. I want them to understand the importance of taking things to Christ. And brothers and sisters, I want you to be encouraged the same way that you get into God's Word, that you pray that every step you take, because when we bathe our steps in prayer, then we won't walk as fools. As Paul challenges the Ephesians here, he says, not as fools, but as wise. But I'm just going to be honest with you. I told you it took me 11 years to finish to get my bachelor's degree at, at, at Clear Creek. It took me 11 years. And it wasn't because my professors were bad. It was because I'm a terrible student. I, just being honest, I am a terrible student. I remember going, we had homecoming at uh, Barnesburg and I brought another uh, gentleman that he's been trying to get back into taking classes online, uh, and I think he's going. I think Nathan's finally going to get started next next year. We've been talking about it, but we came and we seen Brother Donnie as he preached at a church out in Nancy, and I had just finished one of Brother Donnie's courses. And whenever I walked up to him, I looked at him and I said, "I didn't read one word of your book." How do y'all think he responded? It's okay, be honest. He ain't get mad at you. He said, "What?" You see what I found out through, through some of those classes that maybe I thought was nonsensical, like the power to succeed, I learned how I could grab. Uh, yeah, look, y'all laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Y'all like, oh, I love that website. It's wonderful. <laughs> Don't lie in the chapel, y'all. But that class taught me how I needed to learn. So what I did is I took books and I downloaded them onto my Kindle because I'm an auditory learner. And I began listening to the book as it was read. I would take Dr. J. Barnett's lectures that I had and I would copy them and paste them into a document or however I could pull them up on the Kindle and I would let the Kindle read to me. Now you say, well, you're kindergarten first grader. <laughs> I learned and I was on the dean's list the last two semesters once I figured it out. So you tell me who made the right decision. I followed along. When I took the test, I, I, I did better than I'd ever done in all of my years of school. I passed those classes. I had to pray about it and get into that. Sometimes God leads us in a way uh, to, to give us the wisdom that we need. When we walk on our own, we literally walk as fools. I always thought it was great, and I know that uh, your professors have pointed it out numerous times to you all, or maybe just we were sheep, but the Bible considers uh, the people sheep, right? And sheep are one of the dumbest animals on the planet. Yet, we're always referred to as sheep. Folks, we're plum out ignorant of true wisdom apart from Christ. We have zero wisdom apart from Christ. So whenever my family and I prayed about whether that was where God wanted us to go, whenever I prayed about what can I do to be a better student, and that was one of my stress things. That's why it took me so long. I hated, I hated school. I ain't going to play around. I hated it. But yet I knew that's what God wanted me to do. And, and for, for 10 years of it, I fought him tooth and nail, not wanting to do it, but no, I needed to do it. But when I finally just let him just teach me, that's when I began to learn. When I quit trying to be more about me and was being more about him, I was walking as a fool. I look back over sermons I preached uh, 10 years ago, and I think to myself, did anybody really? I hope they didn't hear that. I hope nobody was paying attention. Any other people pastored, preached? Nah, uh, thank you, Brother Matt. I knew you'd help me out there. We've had conversations. Folks, there's times you're going to look back and say, where did I get that? Because we were relying on our own wisdom and who we were. But it's not us. We've got to be about the Lord Jesus Christ and everything. When we do that, when Paul says, don't walk as fools, we won't walk as fools. When we are doing what God calls us to do, our steps must be covered with his guidance. I've been reading through a, a year devotional prayer book, and uh, several of you probably heard of him, uh, Adam Dooley. Uh, I read this, and I thought, man, this, this really hit. He says, the key to finding God's will is a sanctified mind that thinks the way God wants you to think. 
That means taking the time daily, setting aside time to speak with the Lord and then shut up and listen to the Lord. That way He can teach us. And when our minds are in His his wheelhouse, He'll drive it where He needs to drive it. He'll put us where we need to be. And when we have our minds in that way, Psalm 119.35 says, Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. As the psalmist wrote this, and he wrote about this, he's saying, whenever I'm in God's will, the center of God's will, there is no other place that I would rather be. Because that is where he says, I find delight. Folks, how can we be leaders in our churches, in our families, in our communities, in our workplaces, if we don't know how to follow his lead. We can't. It's absolutely impossible. Now, I've been praying the prayer of Solomon for a while now, uh, part of it. You know, God said, Solomon, what do you want? Anything that you ask. And what did Solomon ask for? Y'all have had Old Testament. What did he ask for? Mm-hmm. I understood that. I, I don't think that's an option on the test. Wisdom. He asked for wisdom, but he asked for wisdom to rule over his people. Now, as a leader, we're not called to be a ruler. Uh, Although I've seen some people really misconstrue that, try to be a ruler. We're not called to be a ruler. We're called to follow him. So what I've been praying is, God, give me the wisdom to lead your people. The, the, The church I'm called the pastor is not my people. It's not my control. It's not my church. It's his church. And I cannot be a leader in the church if I don't follow the head of the church, which the Bible tells us is Christ. He is the head of the church. Once we get our mind straight and we start looking in ways that we need to, we need to also understand as leaders we must make the most of the time we get. He says, redeeming the time, making the most of our opportunities. There's a couple of ways that I feel a church service breaks down. Now, if you're like me and you, and you look at church and you've been to church for, uh, I've been since I can remember life. I remember being in church. That's some of my first memories is being at church. So it wasn't like I was out and brought in. I was always going to church as a young man, as, as a little kid, as a little stinker running up and down the basement hallway getting in trouble as mom met us and whipped us because we were making too much noise yeah I I was that kid that done that he says make the most redeeming the time we look at church you have those people in your church that will never never they, they just seem to never have a desire to come to Sunday school classes right Look at it as like it's nothing. Oh, I don't need Sunday school. Well, part of it's a mentality issue. That's a small group. I I get more out of conversations with people in those small group Sunday school classes than than you can ever really get much in a church service because you get to engage with people. But then we come together in the service and we get to worship together and and raise our hands and praise the fact that we're bound for glory and to lift up those things. But some of those people that come into your churches... that God calls you to serve, you are going to see for 15 minutes before the service, 3,600 seconds during the service if you finish in about an hour, and then you may have five seconds to five minutes after the service to engage with them. And that may be all that you ever have each week to engage with those people. I call that 15 minutes before the service the frantic 15 because... Maybe it's just my personality, but during that 15 minutes, I'm trying to shake as many hands and talk to as many people as I can. I've been at the church with Justin. I know I'm going to be admitting this. It's going to be online. There are people in that church. I don't know their name. I don't. Because even when I shake their hand, I say, well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. All I get is a handshake and a smile and a nod. I've never gotten a personal opportunity to get to even know their name. So I have to get help from time to time to say, now which one is that one back there sitting? And, and I ask Justin's papa all the time. He's a big help for me. Folks, I know when you're pastoring, when you're getting ready to preach a message, you're getting ready to share, the last thing that you want on your mind is some negative comment somebody gives you before you get behind the pulpit. Am I right? 
You hate it. It absolutely just digs it. There's been times I've looked at my wife and said, well, that's what I wanted to hear right before I share God's work. That just makes me super happy. Not because she said something negative, but because somebody else did. And, well, my spouse is where I vent. But if I believe God is the one who conquered death, created the earth, created all things in it, created all things around it, and he called me as the failure that I am as a person on my own anyway, and he can do something like that with me, he can take that negative comment and push it out of my head when it's time for me to share God's word. Those 15 minutes may be the only opportunity you ever get to talk to some people in the places you're called to serve. That may be it. And then you have that 3,600 seconds, that, 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 that hour of service time, of worship and of prayer and of, and of sharing God's word. And those, those 3,600 seconds are so important around 3,600 for those of you that preach for that hour anyway. But 3,600 seconds a week, one service, one time engaging with the people. Sharing as much, and I think that's why sometimes as pastors, preachers, that, that, that we preach so frantically because we see these people that are only going to hear God's word one time in the week, and we're trying to dump as much in as we can, aren't we? We try to share as much as we can so they'll grasp it. But folks, we have to take every opportunity to share God's word. I want to tell you, if you have an opportunity to go share God's word, to preach somewhere, to proclaim somewhere, to share your testimony, to, to share a, a sermon, to just share in song, take that opportunity. Because it's an opportunity God is giving you to go share his word. You say, well, I just don't know. God just, he, he, I just don't have a word. I'll never forget Brother Eric Douglas preaching his senior chapel from this very pulpit. And he was sharing, and I don't have the scripture marked what it was, but he said, anybody that says, I just don't have anything to share is full of baloney. He said, because you've got an entire book of God's wisdom to share. Even if you get up and you just read scripture for an hour, you've probably given them more than what we could ever come together ourselves anyway. Because it's all pure God's word. Well, that word challenged me that day. Senior chapel, it was, it was an important one for me. Eric was a friend before that. But even after, we've continued to be friends as much as we see one another. We're in different counties now. But those final five seconds that you have, that's if you, if they go to, our church has a door in the back, has the door on the side. This past Sunday morning, Justin preached for us for the youth service, and I asked him, I said, you want the back door or you want the side door? I'll try to get the other one. We ended up both standing at the side door, and, and everybody's there. And typically, I go to the back door, but it's different. You see some people on one side, some you see on the other. Some wait to see which door you're going to, and then they'll go to the other. Just be honest about it. Depends on what you preach that morning, I guess. But you may have five seconds to five minutes as people are leaving the building. And that may be the only opportunity you get to share the love of Christ in those few minutes. In those moments, I want to encourage you. There's a couple of things that God just, just, just laid on me. Be real. And I told you from the very beginning, be who you are. Be who God called you to be. Be real. Somebody says, how's your week been? You don't, don't act like you're some beautifully great up high person that has the best weeks because you're so close to Jesus. But be real. If you've had a rough week, say, well, it's been a tough one. I appreciate your prayers. Be honest. Be real with people. And say, because I know that God, he, He's still working on me. I always love that old children's song that, that I remember singing whenever I was little and hearing kids still sing from time to time. He's still working on me. We're all still a work in progress. We're all still trying to be more and more like Jesus. It's a process of sanctification through our lives to be more and more like Him. We do that as we seek Him out, as we walk carefully, as we walk not as fools, as we seek His wisdom, and then we go and we redeem the opportunities we have. Be real and share His joy. When you're working with people, sometimes they think, well, you're the pastor. You're supposed to be in a great mood. Everything's supposed to go wonderful for you. There are still people in the church that believe that. 
that believe that a pastor that, that you work three hours a week. This is the first time I've ever been full time in a church. I was bivocational every time up to that, and that's tough. It is tough to be bivocational to pastor to te- I, and I was a substitute teacher. I worked three to three, sometimes five days a week, and the school's working. And then trying to study, I had three kids that were active in robotics and engineering and uh, the academic teams and all these different things going on. Gymnastics, everything that's going on. It's hard to find those times. I don't know what to do with myself sometimes when I've got time to do what I feel God wants me to do. But still, God sends people that help fill that time for you. (laughs) I promise you that. You have to be real when you're with them, and you have to be joyful with them. Yes, share honestly where you are, but the Lord sustains our joy because His joy is not temporary. His joy is eternal. So you have to share that joy with him. Why do we want to be that way? Well, Paul puts it fairly simply, because the days are evil. The things that we see today are not the same things that people seen before. My my oldest daughter and I, we had a good conversation last night. We were just talking about different things, the way that things are for them in school now and the way that things are in school when I was in school and maybe the way things were for some of you when you were in school because I know there's a few of you here that's uh, got more maturity than I do in age. We'll put it that way. And, and we, we have those things in our lives. We look at all these different things. We know the days are evil. It's not hard to see it. Well, in their day, it wasn't hard to see it either with everything they had going on around them. It's not an eye-opening statement, but sometimes we have to be reminded that we are fighting a real enemy, one that wants to shut down anything that has anything to do with Christ. The Ephesians were aware. We're aware. It should be obvious to us as believers to know because the Scripture tells us that the days will wax, as the King James says, worse and worse, right? It's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. This is also why Paul encourages them in chapter 6, verse 11, to put on the full armor of God. He, He doesn't say, talk to Jesus and then be done for the day. He says, put on the armor. When a soldier put on the armor, they were not putting on the armor just to look cool. Just so that way they could get uh, people to be interested in who they were. They put on the armor for the purpose of going out and battling. See, when we bathe our mornings in prayer, and we bathe our mornings in scripture, and we say, God, help me prepare for this day. Don't let me go out and walk like a fool. There's still times we're going to make mistakes. But help hold me where I need to be. When I'm real about who I am. But yet I still live in the joy that Christ has given me. Hopefully they see him and not me. I got the opportunity as we were singing, Bless the Lord. (laughs) Love that song. Took me back to Haiti, Justin. First time that I ever had the opportunity was this year to go to Haiti. It was my first real mission trip, if if you look at it in in that sense. We went down there and we done Bible schools. And we had a building project going on. And we went and done some street evangelism. We shared in a fishing village from house to house. Justin and I took turns sharing the gospel with uh, Patrick doing the... uh, uh, De- Des- Destiné is how his name is pronounced, he told me. He says it's like Destiny, but Destiné. But uh, he was translating for us. We got to see uh, folks in a hospital come to know Christ. We got to see one in the fishing village come to know Christ. We got to see one stand up in the middle of a group of men that were workers uh, stand up and, and come to know Christ with a desire to have Christ come in his life. Folks, those people looked at us and... and it was funny our translators they were cracking up and we walked into that fishing village where they don't typically go the the guy was riding his bike and he's pedaling down through there and he's yelling (laughs) we're like what's he yelling in there translator said he's yelling white people white people 
Because we were going into a place that they, that, that they weren't used to seeing us coming in there. They were used to seeing Mary come in because she come in and she would uh, had medication and stuff to help them out. But we were coming as a group and boy, you could tell that we weren't tourists, but we didn't fit. And we come into this place, we got the opportunity to share the gospel and we went out and we got to stand in the midst, in the dead center of a voodoo temple. With the voodoo priest sitting on his chair, both elbows on his knee, looking at me intently. I told somebody, I didn't know if he had plans to make me the sacrifice or what, the way he was looking at me. But to share the evangel cube right there with him. It was intense. The stare, the gaze that he had on us. And there was some tense moments around it, which I won't go into the details with it, but there was not a salvation experience that took there. No one gave their life to Christ. No, they, they, they're tied into the voodoo pretty stiffly there. But there was a more timid heart when we shared the joy that was Jesus because the intentions this man had after he left the temple were not good. But after sharing God's word, it at least calmed him down and brought a little bit of joy to his life to know that we cared enough. Whenever I had the call on my life on October, October 30th of 2005, I had no clue where God would send me, where I would travel, where I would go. Never expected to be standing in a voodoo temple. Never expected to be walking the shores of a fishing village down in Haiti after an earthquake had pretty much devastated much of their economy. Never expected any of those things. Whenever I stood before the church that morning, I said, I feel like I may be led to missions. I really don't know, but I know God's calling me, and I know I need to follow wherever he's calling me. You cannot be a leader to a church, to your family, to anybody, if you're not willing to follow Christ Jesus himself. Leadership is born in following him. Take every moment you get. Share the word. Personally, congregationally, in a class, however it is. Take those opportunities. Are the parts of your walk, every part of it, are they bathed in Christ's guidance? I was a student. I sat where you sat. I've been, some of you, exactly where you sat. I've, I've been there, and I know what it was like when I thought me first, him second. Even as a student, sometimes we think, oh, no, I'm here. I'm at Bible college. I've got it all right. Not if our mindset's not right. Physically, it doesn't matter where we are. If spiritually, we're not where he wants us to be. Are you walking as he wants you to walk? Are you careful in the steps that you take? And are you taking advantage of every moment that God gives you. God did not give you the gospel that you could hide it and keep it and never share it. He gave it to you with the purpose that he laid out in the Great Commission to take it, to share it, to let others know their need. But folks, we also have to understand our needs as well. I need him every hour. Every hour, I need Him. And without Him, I'm absolutely nothing. I want to encourage you to go be leaders where you are now or wherever God calls you in the future, but to never take a first step until you have called upon Him and followed where He's guiding you. If you follow your own steps, you will trip. If you follow where he guides you, yes, the enemy may force you to stumble, but he'll always hold you upright because the center of his, God's, of, of his will is where God wants us to be. Are we there? Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the beauty of your word. And Father, I thank you that you took someone and you led them to me whenever I was younger to share the gospel, to show the truth, that I may see the need for Christ in my own life. 
Father, I pray for each one of these individuals as they go out to share in whatever capacity that may be, that you and you alone are praised. Father, we're called to work, but it is your Holy Spirit that does the work in the heart. Father, you draw. Jesus, you save. Spirit, you hold us. We thank you for each part of that trinity. And Father, as we go from this place, I pray that these individuals, each one, will be encouraged to go take opportunities to share your gospel because somebody is in the same place they were before they heard the gospel. They stand in the need of Jesus. It's in his name we pray.